Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted that you've decided to join us. You may know by now that we are studying the Sabbath School lessons prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church for the months of July, August, and September of 2014. And this particular series of lessons is entitled The Teachings of Jesus. Now that ought to be very worthwhile. I'm sure it is. This particular lesson is ought to be particularly challenging. It's called Salvation. One, one word title. We don't very often get one word titles. This is lesson four in this series for July 26th of 2014. And while you have your Bible in hand, I hope, or nearby, uh, let's begin with a word of prayer as we ask the Spirit to guide us in our study. Our kind and loving Father, salvation, what a, what a word, and all that it implies. Help us to gain at least a modicum of, of knowledge about that great subject as we talk today about what you have done for us and what you want to do for us. May we take advantage of everything we possibly can as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. What does salvation mean? Healing. The Greek word sozo means to save, but it also means to heal. There's no difference. So let's be very clear that salvation in God's mind means, and the way it's used in the New Testament, all through the New Testament, salvation means healing. Well, why would we need healing? The great controversy is a war. Let's be very clear about that. A war of ideas between a loving, truth-telling God and a lying, deceitful usurper named Satan, who wants us just to relax and continue in our sins. What he does not want us to know is that for each one of us, it is also a choice between life and death. None of us has to die the second death. As promised in that most famous verse, John 3, 16, God has come to this one rebel planet to seek out and save lost sinners. He sent his son Jesus, the Greek form of the Hebrew name Yeshua or Joshua, which means Yahweh saves, Yahweh heals, to save his people from their sins, Matthew 1, 21. Question. Yes. God does not want anybody to die the second death. Mm -hmm. Can you explain what is the second death? I mean, yes, I is can the do first that in death our earth death? Is that the first death? Yes. The first death is the kind of death that we see happening around us all the time here on this earth. It's physiologic. It means our bodily process to stop functioning. Everyone who dies the first death, virtually everyone who dies the first death, will be raised to life again. Okay, so this is a temporary sleep. The second death is the final death, the death that results from sin from which there is no and never will be any resurrection. Is that the death after judgment? Yes. Okay. Okay. We cannot do anything about our past sins. Now, that's real heresy to a lot of people. But I want you to think about it for a moment. Is God going to rewrite history? What would happen if God took all the record of sin out of the Bible? We'd have to get rid of, we'd have to have a giant Bible burning at the entrance to the holy city. Are you saying that God does not erase our sins, but he forgives us for our sins? Oh, he forgives us. There's no, we'll, we'll point that out very clearly. God is forgiveness personified. It's not a question of forgiving us. It's a question of does he eliminate, does he, does he go through history and rip out all the traces of sin? There would be almost no, I mean, considering the fact that we here on this earth are all sinners and we're very good at it, there would be almost no history left. What's interesting is there's a lot of sin in the Bible of mm -hmm. people who sin. Will the Bible be in heaven? I sure hope so. I mean, does it matter if God has a perfect record of it and we're, gonna, we're, we're told that one day he will actually present the panorama of the, of the great controversy from beginning to end in a 3D living color presentation uh, over top, over above the New Jerusalem that has descended down back to this earth. I mean, you wouldn't even need a Bible if you got that. Yeah, uh, uh, history of the earth. Yeah. Why, why is past sins 
why is that even important? Well, I mean, uh, today, I mean, right now, if I go rob a bank, mm -hmm. you know, I get away with it. Uh, then I don't get away with it. Um, they'll haul me to court, throw me in jail because of the past sin. Yes. Because I did that, I need to get thrown in to get, um, to pay back, pay some price or something yeah. of that. That's um, the way human legal systems work. That's, is that the way God's system works? No. It doesn't work that way. No. Okay. God knows that, I mean, I want you to just think logically about this for a moment. If Suppose that w there were a real, you know, the, the way the cartoonists picture it. Here's this gate, and there's Peter supervising the gate, and you want to get into the, into the, the kingdom. Uh, what is it that Peter really wants to know? What, what he really wants to know? What is it that Peter really wants to know? Do you love God? Should you okay. be there? Okay. But what are you going to be like in the future? Exactly. He doesn't care about what happened to you in the past. If he has a guarantee from God that from now on you're going to behave yourself, he says, welcome. He doesn't care about what... Now, we know that our past has implications. We know that the, 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 our sins scar us and all that kind of stuff. I'm not arguing about that. What I'm saying is, you know, strictly speaking, he doesn't care what happened in the past. The only thing he cares about is what's going to happen in the future. So God says, what I want to know is, can you be healed? Can you be changed? Can you learn to live a new kind of life? That's what he cares about. If you, if you can't give up your old ways and you're not willing to live a new life, there's no way he's going to let you into the kingdom. Well, but uh, couldn't, wouldn't everybody, if they lived long enough, wouldn't they come to their senses? No. What happened before the flood? We call that sanctification by senescence. They didn't, they didn't live long enough. <laughs> <laughs> How about the devil? <laughs> hey, a thousand years left. What about the devil? Didn't he learn? Well, didn't he live a long time? Maybe well, he hasn't learned what, everything. <laughs> that's what people sure keep hasn't. asking me, you know. <clears throat> well, there just isn't enough time. You just haven't given them enough time. I mean, God's got plenty of time. Why don't you just give them... All well, the time they need. Let's there's say a few things that we can say for sure. God is absolutely always willing and eager to forgive us our sins if we turn to him. But here's Romans 6, 23. I'm reading it from my Good News Bible. Sin pays its wage death. But God's free gift, what's a free gift? Free. Christ. Is it called grace? A free gift grace? is called grace? God's free gift is eternal life in union with Christ Jesus our Lord. And eternal life is to know the Father and the Son. So you Psalm 17.3. You've got to do some learning. Yeah. That's and you've got to learn to take instructions. That's why I said Peter needs to know if you love God. Just well, because yeah, of what he that's, said. That's part of it, absolutely. <laughs> Those who refuse to give up their sinful past will be destroyed with their sins. This is a result of their sins. Romans 6 said, what? Sin pays its wage, death. It's a result, a direct, death is a direct result of sin. It's not a punishment from God for someone who dared to do something that he didn't want them to do. Okay? Are you talking about rebellion, though? Mm -hmm. Sure. Well, rebellion is what causes sin. Yeah. So if you turn from your rebellion, wouldn't that fix everything? Yeah. So the reason why the devil won't turn is because he will not turn from his rebellion. Sure. Absolutely. Good point. What, what is this, this, what was that last thing about returning from the sins of the past? You, you're not returning. Re would you read that again? Those who refuse to give up their sinful past will be destroyed with their sins. What, what does that mean, if you refuse to give up your sinful past? What does that well, mean? Well, it, it means you're, you're going to continue sinning. That well, wasn't really a sin. Uh, I enjoyed it too much. Is it like Hitler? He, he, he wanted to kill himself rather than change or be captured or, yeah. you know, he didn't want to give up his sin. No. You know, when you say past sins, it kind of sounds like those sins back there. It mm -hmm. doesn't have anything to do with what's coming up future. But I guess what you're saying is 
by saying that you haven't given up your past sins means that you can't. You, you're still, you're doing, still them. doing them. Exactly. Okay. Very good point. Yeah. Now, if you look at the life of David, mm -hmm. he kind of yeah. repeated to himself a few times. Yes. But each time he came back and he was willing to give up those sins for a period of time. Yeah. Past sins are like water under the bridge. As yeah. long as you're making progress to get out of what got, went under the bridge. Yeah. Well, we know First John 4, 8 and 16 say what? God is love. God is love. The Greek word agapao, there translated as love, means a deep and unrelenting care and concern for all his sinful children. What kind of children? Sinful. Sinful children. None of whom do what? deserve God's love. We didn't earn it. We don't have any way to earn it. We have no way to deserve it. But we enjoy it. This is not a feeling on God's part. It's not a whim or an emotional response. It's not, I love you. You know, as some people would say. It is a, ba <laughs> it is a basic principled reaction necessitated by God's very nature of love. God can't help himself. Now, that, that doesn't mean he's in, he never changes. impotent. You don't have to worry about uh, get up on the wrong side of the bed. He's not at all. So every God, day. God does not choose to love that which is only good. God chooses to love everything. Every. We're all and, his children. And hope that we respond to that love. Mm -hmm. So, what does God do? He gave us a gift that is beyond our comprehension, the most precious gift possible, himself. And how have we as a, ra as a race of human beings responded? Look at Luke 18, starting with verse 9. Jesus also told this parable to people who are sure of their own goodness. We don't know anybody who's sure of his own goodness, right? And despised everybody else. Once there were two men who went up to the temple to pray. One was a Pharisee, the other a tax collector. Now we know how this story is going to work itself out, but to the first people who heard it, it must have been a real shocker. The Pharisee stood apart by himself and prayed, and they all said, yeah, man, I wish I could be like that. I thank you, God, that I'm not greedy, dishonest, or an adulterer like everybody else. <laughs> I thank you that I'm not like that tax, co tax collector over there. I fast two days a week. I mean, imagine it. And I give you a tenth of all my income. That's how he talks to God. But the tax collector stood at a distance and would not even raise his face to heaven, but beat on his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I tell you, said Jesus, and they all expected Jesus to say what? Praise that Pharisee. Praise the Pharisee. Look at the way he prayed. No, Jesus said, the tax collector and not the Pharisee was in the right with God when he went home. For all who make themselves great will be humbled and all who humble themselves will be made great. So where do we fit on that scale? I mean, the people who heard that the first time, they knew who the saints were. Because they were dressed like saints, right? And they knew who the sinners were because they worked for the Roman government, right? I mean, you don't, you, you don't, I mean, you don't, we don't need any guidance. It's perfectly plain who are the saints and who are the sinners, right? So how could this tax collector possibly be the recipient of God's forgiveness and the Pharisee not receive God's forgiveness? Surely that was an unjust outcome. Why do you think the tax collector, what characteristics did the tax collector, would you call it humility, mm -hmm. uh, more respect for God? He wanted, he wanted God's help. The he wanted tax, God's help. The Pharisee didn't think he needed anything. I mean, God, look at me. I don't have enough shirt here to hold it out the right. Suspenders, <laughs> suspenders. I need, I need some suspenders. I mean, look at me, God. Did you ever see such a saint? <laughs> you know, like that's what old, he's saying. What? A bit like the old saying, I was conceited, now I'm perfect. <laughs> 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 that's Very good. Well, if God, and, and, and I hope you'll forgive me for being pretty blunt in this lesson, if God gave us what we deserved, what would it be? 
The only thing we could possibly earn by our sinful behaviors is a place in the lake of fire. Revelation 20, verses 14 and 15. So if you want what you deserve, like the Pharisee, what is he going to get? A place in the lake of fire. No, I want grace. Okay. <laughs> That's good. Do I deserve grace? No. No. But you have a gracious God. We have a very gracious God. Fortunately for us, God has done everything possible to prevent us from ending up in the lake of fire. He has taken the initiative. We, we, we had no way of going up to heaven and saying, God, we need help. No, God sent his son down here to teach us the truth about sin, about death, and especially about himself and the Father. Look at some verses. John 7, 28. As Jesus taught in the temple, he said in a loud voice, Do you really know me and know where I am from? I have not come in my own authority. He who sent me, however, is faithful. You do not know him. But I know him because I came from him and he sent me. So he came to do what? Teach us about the Father. Look at John 8, verse 29. And he who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone because I always do what pleases him. Is he trying to teach us about the Father? By doing what the Father wants. John 12, verse 49. This is true because I have not spoken on my own authority, but the Father who sent me has commanded me what I must say and speak. I mean, I, I don't know how it could be so much clearer So when than that. we look at Jesus, we are actually looking at what the Father is. Yeah. He's, his job, we, we read this, it was lesson one or two. Ellen White said his entire mission here on this earth was to reveal the truth about the Father. To re reveal the truth about God, all three members of the Godhead for that matter. So. And mine too. Yes. All three members of the Godhead are doing their best to save us and, and to convince us, of, convince us of the rightness of their cause. And we need to look at those verses. Look at Romans 8, verse 26. In the same way the Spirit also comes to help us, weak as we are, for we do not know how we ought to pray. The Spirit himself pleads with God for us in groans that words cannot express. Now, Carrie, you were talking about praying a while back. There you go. What does that mean? Well, does that mean? What does that mean? We don't know how to pray. Jesus taught us how to pray. Well, I asked the disciples. He was, he was, asked us. He's, he was, we're learning slowly. In view of all this, he goes on Romans eight. What can we say if God is for us? Who else is on our side? Who can be against us? Certainly not God, who did not even keep back His own Son. So now we know it was the Father He's talking about. So now the Holy Spirit is is pleading for us, if whatever term you want to use, with our prayers. The Father is for us, the Son is for us, but uh, he, he didn't, Father didn't keep back His Son, but offered Him for us, and He get, uh, for us all. He gave us His Son. Will He not also freely give us all things? Who will accuse God's chosen people? God Himself declares them not guilty. Who then will condemn them? Not Christ Jesus, who died, or rather who was raised to life and is at the right hand side of God, pleading with Him for us. Who then can separate us from the love of Christ? And he goes on, he just says, there's absolutely nothing that can possibly separate us from God's love. Out of the question. Unless we give our allegiance to Satan, Satan, Satan. We, God still loves us. He will weep as Satan and sinners perish at the third coming. God will be crying. What evidence do we have for that? In the book, uh, Early Writings, I think it's 295 or something like that, and in the book, Story of Redemption page, I think that's maybe 29, don't quote me exactly, but that's pretty close. The, it says the Holy Spirit, I'm sorry, <laughs> the, the devil, soon after he was cast out of heaven with all his angels, they realized how much they had lost. And they said, we've got to do something to get back into heaven. So they asked for an interview with Jesus, an angel came by, they said, please. And Jesus came out there to talk with the devil and his angels. And they wept. Satan wept. His angels wept. Please take us back. And Jesus also wept. And he said, I'm sorry. 
but the rebellion that's in you is not cured. You don't want to come back because you really want to be changed. You want to come back because you've lost your position in heaven. And he wept. He wept over the devil when he knew there was not any chance that he would come back. Well, read 1 John 4.10. This is what love is. It is not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the means by which our sins are forgiven. Okay, what does that mean? He sent his son to be the means by which our sins are forgiven. Something his son would do would allow our sins to be forgiven. Okay, now the usual way this is understood, I want you to, let's look at this carefully. The usual way this is understood is that there's a huge debt of sins. Guilt and sins piled up. And God says something has to be done about this sins. And so Jesus comes and what does he do? Pays for him. Pays for he pays the price. Okay, he pays the price. <clears throat> is, who, who's demanding that someone pay the price? Some people think that God is demanding that Jesus no. die in our place. If, if God freely gives us the Son, John 3, 16, is he going to turn around and demand that Jesus die for us? Does that make any sense? He sent his son because of sin. He would not have needed to send the son if there was no sin, but it wasn't to pay a penalty or anything like that. Romans 8, 3 says, he sent his son concerning, concerning sin. sin or to deal with sin. Mm -hmm. And then you get to Hebrews, it says the next time he comes is not to deal with sin, but to heal or to save. Mm -hmm. Well, if God is not demanding the payment, who is? Satan. Misguided, is God? misguided teachers and misguided churches think that God demands a penalty to be paid. Luke 19.10 in the New King James Version tells us that the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. John 12, 32, we looked at that already, says that when we come to understand the purpose of his death on the cross, it attracts us to him in a way that nothing else could. His death on the cross attracts us. How, how does that work? Does God come and seek us by showing us how much we are loved? by staying on the cross and dying as a display of love. Okay. That's a I starter. Mean, anyway. Jesus himself said, no greater love is there than a man lays it down his life for his friends. So we have that, don't we? We are seeing God laying down his life because of our sin. Well, doesn't that still work if you have a big debt to pay mm -hmm. and then he comes and pays it? Mm. Doesn't that love still come across? So how does that, tell me, <laughs> let's, let's talk about that. Jim's shaking his head over here. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, actually it does, but it's, it's not the whole story. It's not the whole point. It's a very pagan concept. If, you, if, if, if there's a debt over there and somebody comes along and pays it, 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 it that's, that's, that's well, for, yeah, what shall I offer? Have, if you have a big debt on your house and they're ready to, but you ready to take it away. Look at this is my point. If he's if they're ready to take the bank's ready to take it away and your neighbor comes in and says, Oh look, man, I'll pay it for you. That's and that's then he pays it. And doesn't that show that the the, um, the neighbor loves you? That's a beautiful thing. But that we're not talking about that. We're talking about sin, which is self destruct is a disease. And a, a payment of a penalty doesn't take care of the disease, which is going on in your brain. Yeah. Okay. But so, still... Oh, I, that's a beautiful still, thing that, you, that, you, that your neighbor still, did that thing for you. your neighbor still loves you. That no has nothing to, to do with this. And that's, that's <laughs> unfortunately, you know, unfortunately we've, the churches and religions mixed all that stu stuff all up, and we're trying to figure out how to separate it and make sense out of it. The problem with the neighbor paying your debt is that you'll just go into debt again. There you go. And <laughs> easy money, people can't handle yeah, easy money. But still, again isn't say, God's grace continual? Come on, neighbor, come over <laughs> and pay again. And where I think God so wants to... So after that, the, the grace is going to end. And that's, like, that's like and a holy lottery. A holy lottery. But it says, by his stripes we were healed. And so uh, something about Jesus' death heals and changes us. Yeah. 
Well, so Let's the neighbor think about comes that. up and, and pays the debt, plus comes over and heals you by giving well, you classes on how okay. to keep from going is to it, death. Is it his okay. death does that or is it his <laughs> life? Did he come okay. here to live yeah, or very important. Come here to it's, die? It's time, it's time for us to look at some of the things okay. that Jesus actually said. Okay. One of his illustrations is found in Luke, well, three illustrations are found in Luke 15. There's the story of the lost sheep, the story of the lost coin, and the story of the lost son, which they don't mention in this lesson, so we won't go there. But the sheep, did, did the sheep recognize it was lost? Yes. The sheep recognized that it was lost. Okay, did the but coin it recognize it? What? But it had no power to do anything no about it. No power to do anything so. about it. Did the coin recognize it was lost? It did the coin not. has no the consciousness. Did you say that the sheep realized that it was lost? Well, he cried. He cries out yeah. there. Okay. Okay, so here, I'm, this is Ellen White's words I'm about dumber sheep, than the sheep. Sheep's trust me. pretty dumb. <laughs> <laughs> they can be sheep. lost and never know it. Welcome to the human race. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I might just say, I need some food. Yeah. Well, <laughs> since, you since you mentioned the lost son, the prodigal son, the prodigal son also recognized his, right. yeah. his problem. And he could do something about it yes. where the sheep couldn't do anything, and obviously the coin couldn't do anything. And he came home and nobody had to pay anything. Yeah. That's, that's why a lot of people have a problem with that prodigal son story. Because, you know, somehow there must be a, see, you gotta pay, you can't just welcome him home and, and then give him the, re, the key to the uh, re, second half of the fortune. Okay, this is Ellen White's description. No sooner does the sheep go astray than the shepherd is filled with grief and anxiety. He counts and recounts the flock. When he is sure that one sheep is lost, he slumbers not. He leaves a ninety and nine within the fold, so they're safe, and goes in search of the straying sheep. The darker and more tempestuous the night and the more perilous the way, the greater is the shepherd's anxiety and the more earnest his search. He makes every effort to find that one lost sheep. With what relief he hears in the distance its first faint cry. Following the sound, he climbs the steepest heights. He goes to the very edge of the precipice at the risk of his own life. Thus he... Um, Thus he searches while the cry growing fainter tells him that his sheep is ready to die. At last, his effort is rewarded. The lost is found. Christ is page 188. So, what did Jesus have to do to save us? Review Was his death really required? Couldn't God have shown his love for us in some less expensive way? Apparently Jesus not. Jesus had to dive into a cesspool of sin. Mm -hmm in order to reach in and save us. We're swimming in sin. Yeah, drowning in it. Yeah. Well, look at some other words. This is from our Bible study guide um, in, for July 22. John the Baptist described Jesus as the Lamb of God which takes away the sin of the world. Okay, John 1.29. This image was easy for an Israelite familiar with the sacrificial offered, the sacrifices offered in the temple and the sacred history recorded in the Old Testament to understand. Abraham had revealed his faith that God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering. That's what he said to Isaac, remember, on their way. And the Lord did provide the animal to be sacrificed in place of Isaac, Genesis 22, 8 and 13. In Egypt, a lamb was slain by the Israelites as a symbol of their divine deliverance from the bondage of sin. Exodus 12, 1 through 13. Later, when the sanctuary service was established, two lambs were to be sacrificed on the altar each day continuously, one in the morning and the other at twilight. All these sacrifices were symbols of the coming Messiah, who was led as a lamb to the slaughter, because the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Therefore, by introducing Jesus as the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, John the Baptist was revealing the vicarious nature of of Christ's atoning death. Okay, now all you theologians, what is some dark words? What is the vicarious nature of Christ's atoning death? Wow. What it's is more, what more is, than just wow? What does vicarious mean? Okay, something substitutionary. Place of something is something is is taking the place of. Mm -hmm. So here's and kind of with authority to do so, mm -hmm. appointed to do that. So I ask my question again, does this suggest that God the Father is demanding that someone must die to pay the price of sin? No, the law, quotes law demanded that, but or 
But who so made the law? Something. Yeah, but still, you've got Christ taking our place. Why did he do that? Why did he have to do that? Didn't How he, can he do that? Didn't he offer it? Well, it doesn't work in any legal system that's going now that we know of. Yeah, but it's got to make sense. Does it? That's True. the point. It has to make sense. Okay, so how does it make sense? It has to make sense. How does it make sense? How does it make sense? Yeah. Because um, God, a good life requires sacrifice, no matter where you're at, okay. whether you're in heaven or not. Mm -hmm. The devil came around and said, I don't, we don't need to do sacrifice anymore. Okay. Okay. So now you've got Christ coming back to show that sacrifice does result in good. And which is in salvation. Good sacrifice results in good or sacrifice results in death? Well, death, it did result in good because, uh, because Jesus came, died. That didn't, that didn't cause any good? Is that what you're saying? No, I'm. I'm at, uh, let, let's let's follow the story through now. Let's let's look at the bi biblical example. I don't want us to miss what the Bible says. We can feel, philosophize all this. No, all, no, no. I'm getting that. this from the Bible, yeah. from my interpretation. Okay, it's I'm not gonna, a philosophy. <laughs> well, <laughs> your interpretation. You can you can you can accuse me of that if you want, but well, you know, that's the it's way your, I'm It's your interpretation. It. On the cross, Jesus's last words. Well. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Yeah. And I think Jesus was showing us that if we do not turn to God, our last words will be, My God, my God, why are you forsaking me? Exactly. But, but when you turn to God, isn't it his way of life? Yeah. To do good. Mm -hmm. and to, to do what it takes to do good. Mm -hmm. When you go to the devil... He does not want to do what it takes to do good. So, okay, now, theoretically, Jesus should have explained to his disciples as clearly as anyone possibly could why he had to die, right? Yes. He, wouldn't you think that, yes. that he would do that? He didn't explain it. He didn't? Well... There's a lot of people now that don't understand it. So he didn't, he didn't explain it as, as being a penalty. No. I think they understood, okay. though, after he rose from the dead, oh, don't you think? Minute. We have some highlighted stuff. Okay, there. so here we have Luke 18, verses 31 through 34. And, I'm, and I quote, Jesus, Now, this is Jesus on his way from Jericho up to Jerusalem, his very last journey before his death. He, this is one week before he's going to be crucified. Jesus took the twelve disciples aside and said to them, Listen, we are going to Jerusalem where everything the prophets wrote about the Son of Man will come true. He's speaking to his disciples. How long has he been with these disciples? About three to three and a half. Some of them three and a half years. And, and almost all, well, all of them for two or two and a half years, something like that. He will be handed over to the Gentiles who will mock him, insult him, and spit on him. They will whip him and kill him, but three days later he will rise to life. Now, are there any of those words that are really difficult to understand? No. But the disciples did not understand any of these things. They, the meaning of the words was hidden from them, and they did not know what Jesus was talking about. What are they not understanding? That's what I'm asking you. What? Well, they're not understanding that he's going to die. They're not understanding that, if well, they, not you know, he talked in parables. Why he has to die. He, he talked in parables half the time, so they just figured, well, he's rattling on again about these <laughs> things that we don't understand. You're being too blunt. <laughs> you know? Well, Jesus, but, they said, Jesus, you're not going to die because you raised people from the dead. So how, what do you they, mean you're going to? They were certain that he was on his way to Jerusalem to become the next king. Right. Right. They were absolutely certain of it. Everybody was so excited in that crowd that they were marching with. They said, there he is. He's headed for Jerusalem. He's going to be the next king. We're going to get rid of the Romans. And we're going to be his officers. Absolutely. Okay, so how does that teach them why he had to die? Well, it doesn't. It, doesn't it just, point. It, it, the point is, they I didn't that's get what it. You were asking it. The they first did. Well, we're getting to that. Okay. They didn't. In other words, basically, Jesus had three and a half years to explain why he had to die to them. They still didn't get it. Well, he may have explained it several times, 
and they it was so far from them that they didn't even remember it. They didn't yeah. even record it for us. Well, I don't think we need to be too critical because uh, most Christians today don't understand. Yeah. That's right. And okay. There are a lot of verses there. Matthew 16, 22. I just read to you Luke 18, Matthew 20, 28, and John 10, 11. Jesus tried to explain to his disciples that his death was absolutely necessary. That's step one, okay? What did it mean for Jesus to say, this is my blood which seals God's covenant, my blood poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins? What does blood have to do with the forgiveness of sins? Well, when you separate from God, you die. Mm -hmm. And blood is a uh, symbol, symbol of, of death. Life. Of life. life and okay, we need to be clear that no one demanded Christ's death. They couldn't. In John 10, 18, Jesus said, no one, including the Father, is not demanding his death. Jesus said, no one takes my life away from me. I give it up of my own free will. I have the right to give it up and I have the right to take it back. This is what my Father has commanded me to do. Now, obviously, clearly, all three members of the Godhead had sat together and they understood very clearly exactly what they intended to accomplish by the life and death of Jesus. Would we agree with that? And they planned this out before they created any intelligent creatures. Exactly. God didn't twist Christ's arm up behind his no. back up in heaven. Christ so, volunteered. The, the death father, of Jesus. Yeah. The Father commanded me to lay down my life and to take it up again. That's, yeah, that's, that's the way he put it in his words. But he has just said, I lay it down on my own free will, I take it up on my own. So in other words, he's saying, I choose to do it, the Father tells me to do it. We co Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, all of us, we cooperate in this enterprise. There was no sullen submission on Jesus' no, part. It was no, no. all part of the plan. I yeah, do it. Volunteered. What, what, what death? Was it the human part that died? Or no. was it the yes. God part that died? Well, the death of Jesus was absolutely necessary to show us the results of sin. Right. The second death. God is pleading with us not to die that death. Who's pleading with who? God's pleading with us. God's That's pleading with us not to make the mistake of dying that second death. The only one who has died the second death in the history of our world so far is Jesus. Jesus. He says, look at me. Do you really want to die this kind of death? Now some people will say, hold on, I think the wicked were supposed to die in a lake of fire. Jesus didn't burn. What happened? That's all the dead death. They're dead when they're there. <laughs> Yeah. The lake of fire happens after, after your death. After the death. The, the righteous we, live in the fire. Yeah. Do we really understand why Jesus had to die? Are we grateful for what he did? Do we understand the truths represented by his life and death? Look at Luke 4.18. Well, I'm, I'm watching the clock. Maybe I better read. go to John 8, 34 to 36. You know, when I was growing up as a little girl, there was a phrase I always heard. I never hear it nowadays. And that's God forsaken. Uh, you God forsaken this or this is God yeah. forsaken and we don't seem to talk that way. Do you remember that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I've never heard that and that's exactly what Jesus said. My yeah. God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Okay, Jesus is now talking to the Sanhedrin. These are the theologians. These are the congressional representatives. These are the, this is the president of, 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 the, of the nation in his day. Jesus said to them, I am telling you the truth, everyone who sins is a slave of sin. Now, do we want to be slaves to sin? No. A slave does not belong to a family permanently, but a son belongs there forever. If the son sets you free, who is he talking about? Himself. Himself. If the son sets you free, then you will be really free. I know you are Abraham's descendants, yet you are trying to kill me because you will not accept my teaching. I talk about what my father has shown me, but you do what your father has told you. Okay? When Jesus says you will be free, does he mean free from sin? Mm -hmm. Jesus' original audience believed that they had an inside track to salvation with a guaranteed result because they were descendants of Abraham. They, if you had asked every person in that Sanhedrin listening to Jesus' words, if you, if you could ask them, are you saved, what would, it, what would they have said? 
Amen. Unquestionably. Because my uh, DNA is My saved. DNA, and when, look at me. Here I have these priestly robes on. I have these gargantuan, and these, these gorgeous, expensive attire. I'm a Pharisee or I'm a Sadducee. I mean, how better can you get than that, right? You know, Satan used the word I a lot also. Yes. I is the, right in the middle of sin. It's also in the middle of pride, isn't it? Uh -huh. Jesus' original audience believed that he had an ins they had an inside track to salvation with a guaranteed result because they were descendants of Abraham. Do we as Seventh-day Adventist Christians sometimes believe that we have a free ride into the kingdom? I think we Are we saved by our doctrinal knowledge or maybe our personal godliness or maybe by our record of service for God? Yeah, we well, Mm. To who much is given, much is expected. Mm -hmm. So it's a rather responsible position. So salvation isn't free. You Didn't just said that. Yeah, you did. You said, do you think God's given us a free ride? Well, it is only. Let me <laughs> let me finish here. It is only by clearly understanding the truth about God's character and His government, as demonstrated by the life and death of Jesus, that we have opportunity to be saved. God says. It's free, but it costs you everything. Yeah, On several occasions, Jesus stirred up a great deal of controversy by forgiving people's sins. <coughs> you know the story of Mark 2 about the, 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 the paralyzed man who was right, left, let down through the ceiling. What did they say? What did he say to the young man? Your sins, sins are forgiven. forgiven. Your sins are forgiven. And what did the Pharisees say? Oh, Blasphemy. 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 Only God can forgive sins. And that's exactly what Jesus wanted them to say. Only God can forgive sins. And then what he said? What did he say next? Now remember, their understanding was that a, a disease like the paralysis was a direct result of sin. So what do you have to do in order to cure the man? You have to forgive his sins, right? If, if this is a direct result of sin, how are you going to get rid of the disease? You've got to get rid of the sin, right? So Jesus says, okay, I forgive your sins. Blasphemy! Okay, you don't think I can forgive sins? Let me see if I can make this guy walk. Take up your bed and go home. And the guy jumps up, grabs his bed, and walks out the door, and they're going, uh... Well, one of the things, uh, he, was, one of the things he was trying to do with these kinds of situations was to, to show that he was God by doing things that only God could do. Exactly. And they just kept... Uh, <laughs> Can't be God. Well, there's a verse that wasn't mentioned by our Bible study guide, but I think we need to throw it in here. It's very important. Who else did Jesus forgive that was somewhat surprising? The people who were crucifying him. The people who were crucifying him. And nobody was asking for forgiveness. And they weren't asking forgiveness. They weren't even, they didn't care what Jesus had to say at that point in time. Jesus said, forgive them, Father, they don't know what they are doing. Was he talking about the soldiers and the priests, or was he talking about me? He was talking about all of us. Everyone who was responsible for what happened that day. And I quote from Desire of Ages, page 25, paragraph 2, Christ was treated as we deserve, that we might be treated as he deserves. He was condemned for our sins, in which he had no share, that we might be justified by his righteousness, in which we had no share. He suffered the death which was ours, that we might receive the life which was his. With his stripes we are healed. So he gives us this choice. Okay, do you, are you, gonna, do you want to take my life? Do you want to become more like me? Do you want to be saved like, to, to my kind of life? Or do you want to die my kind of death? My life? My death, which do you want? That, that's really what he's saying. Some people would not accept there was not a third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh option. People are always trying to invent other options than what Jesus said. It's, it's heaven or it's annihilation. Accept me or you perish. Okay, let me ask some other questions. Does the death of Jesus teach us something important about the results of sin? Yeah, yes, I think so. Absolutely. 
What would happen to one, one of us if we became separated from God, the only source of life? Cease to exist. We are permanently dead. The life and death of Jesus gives us a choice. We can choose to live the kind of life which he lived, or we will die the kind of death which he died. We can align ourselves with God's side, accepting the, author of all three, the offer of all three members of the Godhead to assist us. Remember our verses from Romans 8. Or we can continue in our selfish, self-indulgent ways and by default choose Satan's side and die the death which Jesus died and end up where? In the lake of fire. You still haven't defined <coughs> the kind of death that he died. You say it's a second death, but what was that like for him? What, yeah. what would, what, I guess the well, question is, what is going the second death going to be like? What Jesus said, <coughs> which is almost beyond comprehension for us, he said that his, the separation from his father, this is Desire of Ages, page of, boy, uh, I'm thinking it might be page 735, but I would have to look back for sure. But he says there, very clearly, as he's dying on the cross, he says, the pain of his separation from his father was so great that his physical pain, now this is after the crown of thorns, it's after all that beating, after being crucified, the physical pain was hardly felt. Now is he saying that if those of us that don't want heaven, we're going to die the death that Jesus died, which means it will be an emotional pain of being separated from the realization we're being separated from God into non-existence. We will perish. Yes. You know, one, I think one of the reasons we don't understand what that was really like is because we haven't experienced it. Yeah. And That's why we're supposed to go to the foot of the cross. And the nifty thing is <clears throat> that uh, we have a chance to never experience it. Yes. We should, God is begging with us, he's pleading with us to learn from the experience of Jesus. And so it, we don't do it ourselves. And it appears at this time, there's only one being that's ever experienced. Mm -hmm. Satan so hasn't experienced that, his no. angels haven't experienced no. that. There are time will come a time when there will be more yes. beings that experience At it. the third coming, at the final end, when God says, okay, the time has come for us to eliminate sin completely sin and sinners, disease, death, all of that's going to be completely eliminated, then yes. So that's, that's possibly one reason why it's so difficult to understand what that is like is because I think all it's, it's something that hasn't, you have to experience that, it yourself and it's impossible to do that until that time comes. Well, you don't have to experience it yourself, but you have to under, try to understand it yourself. You have to, at least, when it was, we don't want to die that death ourselves. We want to see what Jesus did. We want to hear what he said. We want, in our imaginations, see the situation, hear the words, and say, I don't want to go there. You know, there are some people who have, have uh, um, very Christian people, and I'm thinking of, um, right now, of uh, Mother Teresa, mm -hmm. who, in some of her later published works, uh, expressed times in her life when she felt this a great separation. Um, is it possible you can kind of feel that actually? Unfortunately, uh, we are so used to living surrounded by sin that the separation almost doesn't mean anything to us. Like that's me. what's really sad. Oh, that's like what I don't quite understand. Did, God, did Jesus ever start hating God? Start hating God? No. Mm -hmm. Well, aren't the people that are going to die the second death, aren't they going to hate God? Well, they're going to hate what's happening to them. And, and they you think, they think God think is responsible. Okay, so that's going to make them hate God. That, that, so isn't just, that kind of a two different types of death right there? We're missing something here. Yeah, the final analysis and the last end of wickedness the people that go in the fire are going to realize the justness of it all and admit it. Yeah, the reason. Well, that that doesn't the that reason doesn't change anything because the fact is they admit it, but they still hate God. It's not it's not the death that causes them to hate God. It's it's uh, the death is caused be 
because they hate God. If, if we go to the book. That's right. But so Jesus, that's my question then. Jesus, did Jesus ever start hating God? Because no. he needed to hate God to die the kind of sin, death did that they're going to sin. Did he commit all the yeah. other sins in yeah. order to go through this? Well, that's, that's not the point. The point is, you said that there is a separation from God. And, and there was what, a separation that's from what God. Sin does. And that's what caused him all the pain. Because yeah, right. the separation caused him the pain. It's because he loved him so much. Mm -hmm. But he was never sinned. But he the never sinned. sinners are never going to love God like he did. So yeah. in a way, the the death that he's dying there is different than the death. Not so much, because if you go read carefully the book Great Controversy, page starting about 662 and read on to about 675, somewhere in there, where it really describes step by step this whole process, what happens is God will show that great panorama. Satan is going to organize them to attack the city of the New Jerusalem. And these are going to be surrounding the city. He said, guys, we can just, I mean, look at the city's relatively small. We've got it surrounded. Let's just get in there. We need to get to that tree of life and we can live forever. Now, he knows it's not possible, but he, that's what he says. The city raises off the surface of the earth. Jesus is lifted high up. He's crowned as the king of eternity. And then there's this panorama. And the whole story of the great controversy from beginning to end is shown in 3D living color. And people realize the truth. Up to that point, they've hated God, but suddenly they realize who's really responsible for this big mess. And, it's, so, and what happens as, as soon as that thing is over, Satan says, let's attack the city. And they turn on him and they say, you are the one who's caused all the trouble. And they hate him. They attack him. They're not attacking God anymore. Okay, They're attacking him. These people now love God? Well, I don't know. If, they realize that God is right and Satan was wrong. Okay, now, I mean, but, you but when you start what? talking about love, they still didn't I, I don't, love I don't, God. I don't think they have time to stop and analyze whether they love God. They realize what they've lost. Yeah. But what all I'm saying is there. that Jesus loved God even till he died. Yeah. Satan, the, the sinners, they didn't necessarily like God at all. They hated him and they died. So we've got a little difference But they here. die the death of separation. Right. They die the death of separation. Well, that's true. Jesus has made some incredible promises to us. He promises salvation now. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. He also said, that's John 3, 36. He also said, we have already passed from death to life, John 5, 24. And we look at John 10, 10. Jesus assured us that he came in order that we might have life, life in all its fullness. Good News Bible. Jesus has promised us freedom from the condemnation of sin now. What other metaphors did Jesus use to try to describe his role in the plan of salvation? He calls himself the bread of life. What happens to bread? It, it keeps us alive. Off. It, gets, it gets eaten. And what happens when it gets inside our body? It nourishes us. It becomes a part of us. We, we use parts of it to build our bodies, etc. Well, if we intellectually consume the truths of Scripture, it will change us. He who beholds the Savior's match, and now I'm going to read something again from Ellen White, Desire of Ages 661. He who beholds the Savior's matchless love will be elevated in thought, purified in heart, transformed in character. He will go forth to be a light to the world, to reflect in some degree this mysterious love. The more we contemplate the cross of Christ, the more fully shall we adopt the language of the apostle when he said, God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me, and I unto the world. Galatians 6.14 With all those promises ringing in our ears, and with God's gracious offers before us, is there anything we still need to do? Well, what about seeking the kingdom of God and his righteousness and striving to enter into the narrow gate? Doesn't that seem like a contradiction? Do we clearly understand how the life and death of Jesus reveal not only God's justice, but also his mercy? Our Bible study guide suggests that sin is so bad that only the death of Jesus could atone for it. That's in the section for Friday, July 25th. What does that mean? Did the father offer his son, sending him to this world, and then turn around and demand his death?
to appease his own wrath, as some have suggested? Why do so many Christians love to claim God's forgiveness and then feel free to go back and commit the same sins again? Is that God's intent? Or is God's forgiveness supposed to lead us to a changed life? Yes. Salvation, the subject of our lesson this time, is not talking just about forgiveness, it's talking about healing. Remember, salvation also means healing. Is healing a change? Yes. Absolutely. Talk to people walking out of the hospital. Do they say that's a change? Yes. They certainly think so. Does salvation include a transformation and not just a redemption? Yes. How much is included in God's salvation? How does it save us from the results of sin? How do you understand the following words from our, Bi our Bible study guide? Parents who bury their children experience incomparable incom agony. Our Heavenly Father willingly sacrificed His only child, watching, seemingly helpless, as Christ collapsed beneath the weight of humanity's accumulated transgressions and that splintered cross. God witnessed that thorny crown driven through the weathered flesh into body, into blood, until blood gushing downward painted Christ's uh, body crimson. Ridiculing soldiers, crude, unworthy, uncouth specimens mocked their Savior mercilessly. Self-righteous religious leaders uh, shouted, Crucify Him! Compliant government officials, milk toast, abandoned Jesus. Earthly disciples scattered everywhere when Jesus petitioned His Father, silence and shrouded Him. Could despair have pierced with greater fierceness? Thousands of weeping angels waited anxiously, prepared to obliterate Heaven's enemies. Overwrought with grief, they stared elsewhere, unable to understand why Jesus, their esteemed commander, could not receive their assistance. Abandoned by fickle politicians, jaded religionists, and weak-willed disciples was one thing, but his father, too, asleep when greatly needed? Was the father asleep? No. Why should Jesus die for these rebellious priests, these unappreciative followers, these cowardly politicians, uh, and those ignorant masses beyond? Sunday... Uh, Sunset approached, marking the completion of Jesus' agonies, agonizing final minutes. Momentarily, his naked corpse would be wrested away from the cross, ripping his flesh, furthering his disfigurement, etc. And you're going to have to read the rest for yourself. See you next week.